Thank you so much, Carlos, for joining me today and being part of our Speaking Truth to Youth project. I just have a few questions that I'd like to ask you. We'll start with what event or belief in your youth led you to become an activist? What happened was that I, um, I went ahead and uh, I got drafted, you know, and out of high school. So I, I went in the Army. I, I, I had learned how to type. In, in high school. I loved that class, not because of the typing, but all the class was all girls. The only guy, right? So, uh, I learned how to type though, uh, which uh, I, I, I'm convinced saved my life because when I got in the military finally, instead of winding up as a typical soldier in the trenches of warfare, I wound up working in army intelligence, okay? Because they needed a typist and I didn't know how to type. That's what I did in the army. I, you know, I served in the army intelligence uh, branch and I was based in Korea during the Vietnam War. And uh, I was supposed to go to Vietnam also uh, before I got to Korea, but they switched my, my uh, orders at the last minute because they needed a clerk typist you know, in Korea. And unbeknownst at that time that I was, I was going to get started in Vietnam, right? I didn't have any idea. I also was very fortunate in, in being able to be placed in Army Intelligence uh, Unit. I became aware of all the uh, issues, you know, that uh, you never learn about in, in, in basic training, right, for example, or even when you're outside. You know, it was a secret war at the beginning. Nobody knew about the war in 1958, 59. I uh, worked in Army Intelligence and became aware of, of, uh, of all this stuff that's going on. And I grew uh, dissatisfied with the fact that I was part of the uh, troops occupation uh, in Korea. And uh, I learned what we were doing there and I didn't agree with it. This doesn't sound right, you know, I mean, to, to go to a, 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 another democracy in, in the world. In Korea, was at that time, was a democratic government. And, you know, wait a minute, I don't agree with this particular, you know, polit politics going on in this war. And so I, um, I, I kept that in mind that they might want me to go to Vietnam instead to uh, open up an office there. And I said, oh, oh <laughs> I don't know if I want to go. <laughs> Luckily, at the last minute, they, they decided they didn't need me after all. So they already found another clerk typist, you know, over there. And I, was, I stayed in Korea. So anyway, the point being is that being in Army Intelligence, I learned about what's going on. I, and I came to disagree with it, you know. And uh, I had, I put up to the point I had decided to pursue a military career. Army life was great. They fed you good. Not just beans and rice, you know, like I was used to, but, it was, you know, steak and all that kind of stuff. Wow, this is pretty cool, you know. So anyway, I, I went ahead and... Uh, learned about the issues and I began, became very aware and like I said, very much in disagreement with it. So that started me going on uh, on, the, on the path toward uh, peace and not war. When the time came for me to uh, re-enlist, I decided I didn't want to do that after all, that I was going to go out there and I served my time, go back home. And I started organizing against the war. That's what I did. I'm gonna, so I picked up the hardest book to read, a, a book by Dostoevsky, the Russian writer. <laughs> Crime and Punishment, I think, was the name of the book. I said, wow, you know, this is a heavy book. And I, it took me a long time to finally get around to understand <laughs> what I was reading. That's, that's what happened. And, and that uh, set, me, set me apart from the typical GI. So what continues to motivate you as an activist or what guides you? What gives you courage? At that time, it was difficult times, too, in a different way. I don't think as bad as it is now. And so what happened was that um, I decided to, not to pursue this. I said the career, in, uh, a military career, and get out and go back to college. and prove to myself by going to the library and reading on a military base. And I, I had what it takes to be an intellectual. Armed, armed with that knowledge, I went on and... And got back to uh, went went to college and uh, majored in political science and pre law and I was thinking about becoming a lawyer. This was 1968, right? Uh, a heavy year, it turns out. I didn't be known at that time. We didn't know about that. What was going to be happening in 1968? So uh, when I was in, on campus as a student. I became president of the United Mexican American Students Organization. I became aware of the issues. And so I said to myself, well, I can do something, something against this war in the capacity of my being a leader, a student leader on campus. And I started organizing other students and 
for anti-war protest, you know, and stuff like that. So that got me going. I became very anti-war. Decided that I was going to pursue uh, a not a career per se, but a daily path that would uh, enable me to organize against war. Period. You know, uh, using my leadership uh, responsibilities as a way in uh, to organizing on campus and in the community. Uh, I've been anti-war ever since. So at that time, yeah, I was already a, a professor, you know, pursuing an academic career already. And so I decided to become a scholar activist and begin to get involved with anti-war organizing on campus and in the community. So uh, it led from one, you know, one thing to another. And before long, I was uh, identified nationwide as one of the leaders of the, of the anti-war movement. There are some people now that say that we're on the edge of a civil war, given how divided we are as a country. Yes. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, you know, I think we are deeply divided. Uh, but you look at it in a historical context, we've always been divided. You know, there's always, uh, there's never been a time in that all Americans agreed and so forth and all that. No, it never, never been that way. So it, it, to me, it's not, it's not a something new going on now. And so what advice do you have for young activists and young people right now? I think that today, as it's always been the case, uh, revolt starts with the young, you know, historically, you know what I mean? Young people, young students getting out there and organizing against uh, usually war, against war, or against uh, issues that, uh, you know, are confronting American people. I think now uh, the difference is that there is no similar kind of um, uh, leadership, you know, that was there in the 60s. We don't see uh, leaders emerging uh, in the ranks of people who are, uh, are anti-war for some reason. I think it has to do with the fact that um, it's the, the role of the mainstream media to uh, sort of like uh, report the news or whatever in a way that uh, is not uh, critical. They don't have the people being interviewed that they are able to raise the issue uh, publicly, you know, they kind of like purely controlled by corporate America, you know, I mean, people buy into what's being reported and they don't ask questions, they don't take into consideration or think about, wow, who's responsible for all this more uh, sales and makes money? And uh, so uh, the corporations are uh, in, in, the, in the business of making profits at the expense of human needs. So it's a very careerist orientation amongst our young, but it's a whole different era now. We're in a very, very, I would say, I hate to say it, but a, a fascist era, era today, you know? I mean, it's a whole different time right now, a whole different time. I mean, uh, it's back to the 50s in many ways, I think. You know what I mean? Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Have a nice day. <laughs> Thank you.